Welcome to you all to this symposium in honor of Bartha H. Romani. Uh, my name is Josine Pluim and I'm your host for today. I assume that most of you know Bart very well and um, <coughs> then you must know that scientifically he has two great loves and one of them is Mathematica. It formed the base for many of his achievements, if not all of his achievements, and it resulted in him earning the Wolfram Innovator Award in 2013. Bart's second scientific passion is teaching. Nothing pleases him more than to enlighten students on image analysis and to pass on his enthusiasm for science. He therefore jumped at the chance of organizing this symposium that is meant to give you an overview of some exciting science, both some recent results and pearls from the past. The fact that you are, so many of you are here present today to enjoy what he has put together for you, I'm sure will delight him. Um, it is a rather packed program today, as you may have seen, so perhaps I should warn you that Bart used to plan his group scientific meetings during lunch breaks, so I hope you brought a sandwich. And uh, one last uh, question, could you please all check your mobile phones to make sure they're as silent as can be? And with that, I'd like to move on to the science of today and to our first speaker. First speaker is Professor Paul van Waas. He's Emeritus Professor of Radiology at the University Medical Center Utrecht. Uh, he and Bart go back a long way, at least as far back as 1983, when Bart started as a physicist at the UMC Utrecht, or the Academie Ziekenhuis Utrecht at the time. And uh, he will reveal some facts about Bart's early years in science. Uh, good morning. Uh, dear Bart and Hattie and friends and colleagues of Bart, it's a real, real great pleasure that, that you have invited me to, to give this, this lecture. In the beginning, it was quite cumbersome since I had to go back to the early years of 1983. Since uh, Bart, you arrived with us when we were still working in the old 110-year-old hospital at the Katharina Singel in the medieval center of Utrecht. And you, you left uh, Utrecht when we are, were working at the campus of, of the Uithof in, in Utrecht. And uh, it is an amazing period. I didn't realize you. As a, a young scientist, you did a beautiful PhD thesis on uh, your own musculature, making microelectrodes and introducing in your own calf. And uh, that was highly scientific. And you draw the attention of Peter Lever, who advised us uh, to appoint Bart. And so you came, and then after 2002 you left, but having a great time with my wife uh, in Chicago. So in short, to end this lecture, uh, you have been a disruptive medical physicist. Everything changed. And you became a major player in the European radiology, leader of the Dutch Picture and Archive and Communicating System project, and an, and an active member of the European Congress organization. So now I'd like to share you a bit of uh, history. Um, the board of directors advised us to hire and a medical physicist to protect us from the great dangers of radiations and, and also uh, to take care of the maintenance and purchase of equipment. Until then, our own prerogative, we didn't need a medical physicist. And Peter Lever, who is present here, he suggested uh, that Bart was uh, not dangerous, but a highly interesting person, and, uh, but we didn't like to see him as a radiation buster. Um, but nevertheless, we have followed the advice of Peter Lever. And so you see Bart working at his first desk. 
Um, nobody would tell he would became a great gardener when you see the deplorable state of this plant. There is an analog telephone, there is a, a light box, and there's no trace of computer of informatics at all. But nevertheless, he was functioning well. <laughs> we, uh, on the contrary, were working in, an, in a damp central reading room, packed with outer alternator, and with a lot of heat, and sheet film only. And, and there was no, no trace of computers of image processing yet. A terrible place. And then something strange happens. Jan Koenderink invited uh, Steve Peiser to work with him, and he proved to be a deus ex machina, since he started to work with uh, uh, Bart and Karel Zuiderveld, also present here today, his first uh, co-worker. And he, Steve brought with him uh, the beautiful software developed in his own department. Oh, sorry. Uh, and one of his co-workers, Mark Levoy, developed 3D rendering, a known format at that time. And this is the work of Karel Zuiderveld with closed vessel projection instead of maximum intensity projection. A real wonder. And then Bart made a major step that changed everything. Karel Zuiderveld looks harmless, but he was planted in the middle of our damp reading room so he could check immediately if it was effective what he was doing. And we as radiologists could witness the wonders of medical imaging. And he did a good job, so he was promoted to Max Viergever's department of the Image Science Institute and got a beautiful, great office, far better than he had with us. And here is Carl still working. And he, he became a senior developer, developer with Vital Images. And Bart was just following his visionary passion for understanding the visual system. Um, Bart uh, told us a dream of total conversion from analog to digital. This is our main reception desk with an alternating uh, uh, archive for paper folders with patient data. And everything was analog, a, a huge archive with sheet film. And this is a holy hour and film discussion uh, session with a so-called hot seat. And it's just sheet film and auto alternator. Uh, an important man was also André Achterberg. He was simply gluing reports on paper folders. But he was the man who designed the logistics of a future PAC system. All the algorithms needed. A very important step forward. Bart arrived in 1983, and already in 1984, he explained to us that, uh, that the construction plans for our new hospital, where we should move in in 1989, was uh, not uh, coping with the near future of uh, uh, digitization. So we had to, to drill huge air vents in thick concrete like, like this. We had to make extra space for huge computers and, and when we moved in in 1989, the computers were very small, produced no heat anymore, and we could place an extra CT scanner in the computer room, and we, we didn't pack at all, but it was a, a visionary approach. Um, you have to realize that we were already digi going digital in 76 with dual slice body CT, digital ultrasound, digital subtraction angiography, and magnetic resonance and spiral CT. But everything was analyzed on a standalone viewing console, and then the sheet film produced mounted on viewing boxes. Uh, a, a very cumbersome method. But in the main, meantime, Professor Karl Heinz Hörne in Germany developed the visible human project, uh, a, a cadaver uh, sliced in very thin slices and then reconstructed again. And that was uh, the landmark, how we could work with CT slices and uh, MR slices. And the industry developed together with the American College of Radiology, a so-called DICOM standard, so you could couple the, uh, the different uh, species of equipment. Uh, the 3D images were highly preferred by clinicians, as the beautiful work by Frans uh, Zonneveld, 
with a lipoma and a, a terrible tumor and successfully operated upon. But the radiologists, they said, no, that is for simple conditions. We don't need 3D images. And, uh, but Bart uh, kept up high spirits and celebrated every landmark in the meantime. But the, the, the greatest thing was that Bart returned from Washington University in uh, St. Louis and got a grant to build the first concept digital reading room in Europe. And there is a huge room for computers. And here we, he could set up uh, the ideal concept of a reading room with beautiful ergonomics. So the, the, the cathode ray tubes, the bulky ones, were mounted in a tilted way in the desk. And we had to uh, digitize everything since the whole department was based on sheet film. But instead of uh, three days, we could uh, report everything within 24 hours. But this is nowadays ridiculous. This, this is sheet film digitized again, and then digital on, on, an analog, on a screen, but still analog. You could only look at the images and not work with the images. And th this is the standalone unit for the, digit for the internal medicine department. But nevertheless, everybody was happy. So in 1989, the PAX uh, project uh, ended. We moved into the new hospital. The system designed by, by Bart was four times more expensive than our film-based system. The DICOM coupling of coupling uh, even Philips equipment to Philips equipment was impossible. And the computer data network had a limited capacity. And it, it took uh, 2004 to realize all the dreams by Bart. So 20 years after his visionary initiative. So he had a beautiful congress in, uh, in Utrecht in 1988. But in the magic year of 2000, we are still looking at sheet film and, and, and looking at monitors, but not a PAX. But th this sounds negative, but you have to realize Bart was among the four greatest pioneers of Europe. The man who started all this was Oscar Craig, but his technology failed, but he, ha he had the first initiative. Then Bart had the vision to couple a hospital information system and radiology information system to PECS and view the typewritten reports on the workstation in the digital reading room and the workstation in the clinic. Then Michel Osto you know, from Brussels, he made a high-speed network. And Walter Ruby uh, from uh, Austria had the guts to create a totally filmless academic hospital, fully digital. And it worked. Amazing. So speaking about Vienna, Bart and I, we went to the European Congress. And Bart was quietly astonished uh, that uh, there was no image processing uh, visible yet. So in 1997, he took the initiative to invite 10 top academic research groups uh, to show their uh, image processing uh, results uh, within radiology. And it had a beautiful name, the, that alley uh, of exhibits, the Golden Mile, later on Matrix and Imagine. And since 2014, it's now completely in integrated among the main topics of the European Congress, so radiomics, deep learning, and computer-assisted diagnosis, things we will discuss today. And the same is happening in Chicago at the Radiological Society. So, in, in short, when Bart arrived, uh, it was hot and damp and sheet film, and we had no idea what was uh, waiting for us in the near future. And now, today, in uh, 2017, all the dreams of Bart are realized. Everybody is reporting on at least four screens, higher, not 1K, not 2K, but 4K and even 5K screens. And uh, this month, this last month, uh, the last dream of Bart is, has opened up, the digital conference room. With, with, uh, and here you remember the concept Bart designed in 1986 that you, that you should look at tilted screens. 
And here, the 42 participants can do video conferencing with other clinics worldwide, and they can discuss with, with the other disciplines within the hospital, and everybody looking at his own screen and to, to each other. It's not in a college, in a uh, room setting. So, to end this talk, Bart, the start of your splendid career was quite disruptive. We didn't expect this all. It gave our department an, an image, a tremendous boost in image analysis, totally unknown for us. Uh, we, we got 3D to assist clinicians, but also ourselves. PEX is normal in the daily web network for teaching and research as well. And last but not least, this year, um, the World University Rankings uh, published that uh, among the 10 best uh, departments is Utrecht Uni University, and you are really part of that success. Bert, thank you for everything. Thank you very much for this beautiful overview of how things have changed since the very start of your career and how it's all due to you. Continuing with uh, the early history of Bart de is Professor Max Viergever. He's Professor of Medical Imaging and Director of the Image Sciences Institute, also at UMC Utrecht. Uh, as said, in 1989, Bart moved from the Department of Radiology to the group of Max, at that time known as the 3D Computer Vision Group. Beste Bart, beste Hetty, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a pleasure to give this presentation today on the occasion of Professor Bart Tahar Romani's retirement. I've known Bart for more than 30 years since the mid 80s, when I was still working in Delft, but was an active participant in the Utrecht Working Group on Medical Image Processing, which, which existed since uh, the end of the 70s. And Bart joined this working group around uh, 1985, together with Paul van Waas and Karel Zuiderveld, from which moment onwards we intensified our collaboration and it was a pleasure to um, be in the Image Sciences Institute together as of uh, 89 when uh, you moved over to the Institute. As a physics engineer from Delft, um, you started a PhD project in Utrecht in um, 1979. Um, the cover of your thesis has already been uh, shown by Paul. The subject was organization and control of motor units in human upper arm muscles, the physics department of Utrecht. And um, to give you an idea about the experiments that Bart carried out, I have two um, figures from his thesis booklet. This is the first one, the experimental setup that he used, which looks much less organized than Bart is nowadays. And uh, the second one is a nice picture of a muscle force measurement apparatus. And this already looks a little bit like a scanner, so may have been indicative of the next career move of Bart, but some of you may rather think of it as a washing machine when you see this. Um, the fascination you had, Bart, for biophysics has remained ever since, but has been extended by two more research areas of interest, computer vision and solving real-world medical imaging problems, especially in the radiology. And Paul has already given uh, quite a bit of flavor of Bart's efforts to bring radiology to the 21st century. So I will concentrate more on computer vision. And Bart's love for this field was spurred by the pioneering, pioneering work of uh, Jan Kundrink, professor at the physics department in Utrecht, and of Steve Pizer, in professor of computer science in North Carolina, who visited Utrecht in 1983-1984. Uh, and this article by Jan Kundrink was actually um, quite seminal for the field of computer vision. Jan was, uh, Kundring was a renowned expert in human vision. He used his knowledge of this field to translate it to computer vision. Basic idea is that humans, when they look at the scene, see not only that scene as a whole, but also all sorts of details. So when I look into the hall, I see a hall full of people. So thank you very much for all joining us today. But I also can focus on individuals or even to an individual's face or clothing or whatever detail you would like to see. And the, the nice thing is you can even do that simultaneously. So Bart picked up this idea and um, 
started to use this, this uh, shining example from the human visual system to um, do image processing in this way. This is an MR image uh, of the, what we had in the, in, the, in the 80s, let's say, 87 or so, something like that. So uh, that's about the quality we could um, produce at that time. And uh, what Bart did is use the, the properties of the human visual system to um, build um, an approach which he coined skill space. And what you see is that you don't have only the image at the original resolution, but also all sorts of um, smooth versions of that image. And that made it possible to look both at details and at the image simultaneously and to improve on image processing algorithms. The most frequently used kernel that we used was the Gaussian kernel and the derivatives of the Gaussian formed a toolbox and with this toolbox we could analyze all sorts of images and we played around quite a bit with that both with synthetic images to understand the properties and also with real world images and this is just a toy example of what we did there. The DOM tower um, and you see for instance uh, by having the scale space and the deriv derivatives of this Gaussian that you can see edges of structures much nicer than uh, in the original image. Um, there are many more um, nice results, but you will see most of these in the talks later today, so I will not uh, delve into that now. I already mentioned Professor Steve Peiser, University of North Carolina and Chapel Hill. He was in Utrecht twice, once from um, 83, 84 for a year, and once for half a year in 92. And he had lots of discussions with Bart about multi-scale um, image analysis, but also about quite a few other non-scientific things as well. He became a very good friend of Bart and uh, Hetty's. Um, unfortunately, he cannot come to Eindhoven today, but he was so kind to send us a video message that I will show now. This is Steve Peiser from the University of North Carolina. Bart Tarumeni and I have been friends and colleagues for more than three decades. I was on, honored to be at his and to be at the wedding of him and his lovely wife, Hetty. I watched with admiration, trying to provide a bit of help as he set up the PAX unit in the radiology department at what was then at Akademie Ziekenhuis Utrecht, a unit which later turned into a leading medical image analysis research unit. Likewise, I admired his teaching of many doctoral students in that unit and was impressed when he finally was named professor at TU Eindhoven. There, he organized the productive research unit in medical imaging in the biomedical engineering department and energized the important connections between image science theoretical research and applied medical image analysis research for computer-aided diagnosis that we find there today. I admired his idea and execution of basing image analysis teaching on Mathematica. In Bart's Utrecht and Eindhoven posts, he influenced a great number of doctoral students and faculty colleagues, which have led to the very large number of publications of which he is co-author. And he has influenced my teaching for years and still I have used his books on front-end vision and his edited volume on geometry-driven diffusion in my own course teaching. The aspects of Bart's career that I most greatly admire is the effect of his great teaching talent. I am wowed by his great teaching not only in Nederland, but also in Northeast China. I wish I could be in Eindhoven today to hear his Afstreitskollege and to celebrate with him. All our best for the coming year, Bart. Within a few years, I'm talking now about the early 90s, scale space was a hot research issue in the computer vision community. And here you see a number of scale space scientists gathered at that time. Um, People like uh, Guido Gehrig, Olaf Kupler, uh, Pietro Perona, Jitendra Malik, Luc van Gool, Ros Whitaker, and of course the Utrecht uh, crew that was there. Picture taken at um, European Computer Vision Conference in Genova. And part by that time, it also gathered a nice group of PhD students and postdocs working on multi-scale image analysis. And this group was 
usually referred to as Bartahar and the Romanis. <coughs> Luc Florac, Alphonse Salde, Wiro Nisse, Robert Maas, Bram van Ginneke, and postdocs Mes Nielsen, uh, Joachim Weikert, and Stilian Galitsin. A very nice group of people, all very productive in science. And um, you will see um, quite a few of them later today. 50 years that Bart spent on uh, multi-scale image analysis in Utrecht were very fruitful. There were many scientific articles, of course, PhD thesis, and no less than three books, two of which I've mentioned already, um, by Steve Pizer also. Used the first book very much, very much in his courses, but many people did that. It was uh, really um, a landmark for this field. Um, I think it came out in 1994. And then uh, the middle book hasn't been mentioned yet, but it is a book on uh, the conference that Bart organized in Utrecht in the 97. And uh, it was called, it's rather presumptuous at that time, the first international conference on scale space. Uh, we didn't know at all whether there would be a second conference, but you were right, of course, Bart, because it had many um, successors and it's in fact still a continuing a series now. Um, but you were not really a person to easily delegate tasks to other people. You carried out all sorts of tasks yourself. And maybe that was because some assignments given by you did not always work out the way you wanted them to. I will give two examples. One is, um, refers to Karel Zuiderveld. You've seen this picture already in Paul van Waas' presentation. Uh, Karel was working in our group and had this marvelous piece of technology, a Silicon Graphics O2. And Bart had asked Carol to couple this, um, to connect this uh, computer to the MR scanner so as to enable faster processing of images. And what happened was this. <laughs> so Carol took the assignment of connecting the computer to the scanner a little bit too literally. And it <laughs> took quite some effort and time and money because uh, the MR scanner had to be quenched to uh, separate the computer from the MR scanner again. This is the second example. Um, an assignment to our secretary, Margot, 50 copies, please. Which Margot, and then geniet, which Margot understood as 50 copies, please, enjoy. And she felt outraged by such a request. <laughs> and um, was happily relieved when one of our PhD students, who happens to be the chair uh, of today, explained to her that Bart probably had meant the other very distinct meaning of the word geniet, word geniet which is stapled. So, uh, <laughs> but such, such accidents were rare. In fact, Bart scored many successes and even established many records in that period. And the remarkable one is that uh, Bart had the largest fraction of cum laude PhD graduates. The four you had in Utrecht, three got a cum laude PhD, and the first one in Eindhoven also got a cum laude PhD. So the, your first five PhD um, graduates, four got a cum laude, which is really remarkable. And all these four will give talks later today. Um, Bart also holds the record of the shortest PhD project that uh, was supervised in Utrecht. It concerns someone who enthusiastically started his first day, and at the end of the first day, after having left the hospital, phoned us to say that uh, research was not really going to make him happy, and uh, he announced that he would leave for France the next day to pick grapes. <laughs> you still remember that, Bart? <laughs> he mentioned in passing, by the way, that he did not expect to receive a salary for that one day he worked. This might suggest that Bart was not a good supervisor, but the contrary is true. true. The contrary is true. I know no one who is better able to stimulate students than Bart. He enjoys teaching and lecturing very much, and is also able to transfer his own enthusiasm to his students, his colleagues, and his audience if he talks for an audience. With multi-scale image analysis, Bart had combined two of his fascinations, biophysics and computer vision, and the third one I mentioned was solving real-world medical imaging problems. This is an example of um, segmentation of MR brain images. He also worked in other fields like texture analysis of lung radiographs, and even delved into other um, medical disciplines like um, obstetrics in detecting ovarian follicles from ultrasound uh, images. 
So in this way, Bart succeeded in combining his three main scientific fascinations by working on biophysically inspired computer vision for solving medical imaging problems, which nicely covers the 30 plus years of research in Utrecht and Eindhoven, also covers the program that you will further hear today. Bart, thank you very much for the times we shared, and I wish you, Bart and Hattie, all the best in the time to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, in fact, for recalling all these tales and all these, this work from a period long time ago, I think a period many of us here have not witnessed personally, and it was great to hear. It's now my pleasure to welcome a guest from abroad, our next speaker, it's Professor Alfred Brookstein. He uh, holds the Ollendorf Chair in Science at Technion in Israel. And, uh, at least one of the times he and Bart worked together was not that long ago when they were chairs of the conference on scale space, there it is again, now combined with variational methods in computer vision in 2011. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be invited here. Uh, I don't even remember when I first met Bart. Uh, it seems like uh, forever. Uh, and, uh, and I think it, it might have been at one of the scale space conferences and, uh, and uh, the most memorable uh, thing that happened is that we went to these scale space conferences and then at some point uh, my colleague uh, Ron, Ron Kimmel at the Technion was my student and became a, uh, a member of the community, told me why don't we put a proposal to have uh, the conference in Israel. And uh, at some point uh, we did this and uh, we had a discussion about this and many people were afraid of coming to Israel for obvious reasons. You know, it's the Holy Land but it's a very troubled area. And then, uh, surprisingly, Bart came and said, oh, it's wonderful, it's peaceful, it's quiet, we can go there. And we had, uh, uh, we won the, the bid to organize the conference in Israel and Bart was um, a, a co-organizer and we had a fantastic conference which is very, very aptly, at a very apt location. You know, the conference we had was at the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest point on earth and uh, scale space and variational method is about finding minima, okay? So we went to the global minimum in order to have the, uh, the scale space and variational methods conference. And this is, in fact, all about, uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, optimization and finding minima. So I was asked by Bart to tell you a little bit about... Uh, about scale space and variational methods and variational methods and how they evolved. And actually, if you now look at the, at the literature on, on, uh, on, on image processing and computer vision, it is dominated by a few paradigms. The, the one paradigm is optimization. You are looking for the best. But often, uh, the best is described by some criterion and, the, and how do you design the criterion is very, very, uh, is a very subjective thing. So therefore, you have to design criteria in, uh, in, in, in a nice way. And then there is the other aspect of the, of, the, of the problem is how to model your signal. You know, your signals are coming from some place. And Bart, being a physicist, he knows that there are certain processes there are, certain, uh, there are certain things that generate these images and therefore they are not just random images, they have structure and the structure can be modeled. So you have to, uh, to put in a model for the, for the signal. So you combine a model, you combine a, 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 a model for the distortions that you have and then you can talk about optimization. And uh, it was at some point that there were two conferences running in parallel. One was scale space and the other one was uh, variational methods. 
and the two conferences joined together and today there is a very successful series of conferences that is called Scale Space and Variational Method and Bart is one of the founding fathers of the, of the, of the field. Um, I prepared a talk which was a little bit too technical for this, uh, for this audience, but I'm going to give you a tiny example of what I mean when I say that um, we are working on, on these parallel, um, on these parallel uh, aspects of modeling and, um, well, I'm going to start here. Uh, here is a minimization problem. So we are very often given a noisy signal. Signal is an image, okay? The, the, the signal is this M of T, and N is a noise, is an unwanted disturbance that is added to it. Now, uh, when I say that we want to uh, recover M when we are given this R, which is a distorted uh, signal, we want to minimize M uh, we, we want to find the, the minimization of a functional of this M, which combines two terms. The first term is how close is this R to the original, to the, to the, to the, to the, how close is M to the, to the given R, R is given. And the second one is some information about the, about the, uh, the signal M. For example, you would like the M to be uh, very smooth, and when you want M to be very smooth, you, uh, you, you take its derivative and you integrate the changes of its derivative, and this gives rise to something that dominated in the past few years the variational method. It's called the rudin osher fatemi framework. And here I just rewrote the rudin osher fatemi framework in terms of M dot, in order to put it in a form that, uh, that I want to, to use a little bit later. Don't, uh, don't pay too much attention to the equations because they are not important. What is important is that you can uh, then discretize the problem and you have a, a discrete problem in which uh, matrices are involved. And then what you have is you have a model for the signal which is, uh, which is uh, of the following form. You have a signal that is a composition of known functions, of known phi i's, and they have um, coefficient functions which are also functions of the, uh, of the variable parameter t. t can be x and y in, the, in, an, in an image. Okay, so what you have now is you have a model and you have a, an optimization criterion and you want, as, uh, as we all did in, in, in at, the, at, the, at the global minimum at the Dead Sea, you want the, 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 optimal, the optimal signal. Now, when you write these things, you, uh, you, you write this functional which has two parts. One is how close is your model to the given data, and the second one is how do you measure the uh, variations of the coefficients, and this is called an over-parameterization model. So today uh, we are uh, in the era of over-parameterization and sparsity. Okay, so there are, uh, the, the people went into, into this area of sparsity, so I want you to concentrate on a very, very simple example. Suppose that your image is, or, or, your, or your signal is just uh, made of, of, uh, of piecewise linear uh, functions. So if, you, if, you're, if your signal is made out of piecewise linear functions, then this is your model, and it's, a, it's an artificial model, but it captures what, what, is, what it is all about. Now, if your signal is, p is piecewise constant, it can be written as one multiplying some uh, coefficient which will change, and t multiplying some coefficient which will change, but the, these coefficients will be piecewise constant. And this is uh, putting a, a lot of constraints on the, on the model that you have. And then the question is, how do, you Im how do you impose sparsity? Now, piecewise constant signals are sparse 
in the following way, that if you take their derivative, their derivative is very, very sparse because it's mostly either zero or a delta function in, in, some, in some right uh, way of measuring it. And the coefficients have to change um, according, uh, according to this sparsity uh, model. And recently, we combined all these things. And let us, let us uh, just present the result. So here is the problem. You have a signal which is piecewise linear. And you have the noisy version of it. So what we, you would like is you would like from, from this noisy version of the signal, you would like to recover the clean one, OK? So then you write the overparameterized representation for the piecewise linear function. And you do the uh, sparsity-based solution in which you want to recover the coefficients, but you want to recover the coefficients that are piecewise constant, and they have jumps that jump in synchrony. Now, this is an interesting problem, and it leads to another new type of, uh, of uh, optimization problem, and this gives uh, better and nicer results than uh, before for this particular Problem. So look at this uh, line fitting experiment. These are, this is the, uh, the real signal. The real signal is the blue one. And the red uh, signal is the one that you are recovering. And here you can see that the coefficients are jumping and they are piecewise constant. And this is something that we enforced, OK? This is something that we enforced. And this is something that we can enforce using sparsity. So the buzzwords are. Uh, variational methods, modeling of a signal in a sparse model, and doing the recovery based on these two on, on these two principles. And this is much much better. This yields much much better results than uh, uh, than 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 other alternatives, due to the fact that you are talking from an understanding of the signal model, OK? So the, the, the idea is that you have to essentially exploit the model of the signal. And this is a message that is extremely, extremely important and is sinking in into the community. And we have, uh, we have, uh, 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 we have, we are making progress in this domain. So from 1D, you can go to 2D. And here you can see uh, an original signal, which is which has this band, and uh, there is a background which is changing. And this is an image. This is the noisy version of the signal. This is the standard uh, uh, PSNR recovery with uh, the Rush, Rudin Osher Fatemi, which was the reigning uh, method before. And when you do these, uh, these, new, these new methods, you are getting much better results. PSNR is something that measures the quality of the recovery, and you have to uh, have these numbers higher, as high as possible. And you can see that you can easily beat the, the reigning, the reigning uh, methods. And it is, it is, it is an interesting, uh, it is an interesting example because you can see that using the model you are getting uh, quite, uh, quite good results. And you can do it for for other images, and uh, you can also use this for other, uh, met for other signal processing tasks like segmentation and uh, other, other, other problems like in-painting and so forth. But I'm not going to tell you about this. I'm going to just uh, say the following thing. Retirement is a, is a, is a waypoint in our, in our life, OK? We are reaching a point where we have to retire, but in academia, retirement has absolutely no meaning. But uh, it, this is a nice event. We are celebrating you. We are celebrating 30 uh, years of, of work and uh, maybe t more than 20 some 20 something years of, of, of meetings. But you are not retiring. <coughs> I'm telling you there, there is going to be absolutely no change in your life, 
don't expect now that you can go fishing. You are going to continue your projects and we are going to meet at conferences and at many, many events. We are organizing a beautiful uh, uh, summer school in Romania together and we'll continue to do so uh, very often, I hope. And you have your project in China, uh, which, will, which will go on. And, uh, and what is beautiful in academia is that, is that our enthusiasm will never cease because it is fed by the enthusiasm of the young people around us. So congratulations on this waypoint. It's not a retirement, it's a celebration. Congratulations. <laughs>
you know, we should uh, try to figure out the theoretical mechanism behind that and exploit it. And most of the theoretical mechanisms behind it are not well understood. Um, there are only very few exceptions. Maybe um, the case of micro tremor in the eyes that uh, has been explained as a mechanism for super resolution. And once you understand those mechanisms, you can use them to your financial advantage and build uh, reverse engineering applications and sell them for a good price. Yeah. This camera is bu built on that idea to use micro tremor for obtaining uh, super resolution. <coughs> Uh, but most of the mechanisms we don't really understand. Uh, so that's for the inspiration part. Um, and now for the motivation. Um, it has, uh, um, <clears throat> there has been a study com uh, commissioned by the European uh, Brain Council to uh, investigate the economic impact of brain disorders in Europe. And this was over 2010. The study took place in 2000, was published in 2012. And it shows these staggering figures, eight, almost 800 billion euros annually uh, spent on, well, economic costs that are incurred by uh, brain disorders of one form or, or another, only in Europe. And maybe you've seen the news item this week on the Dutch uh, television, that uh, the observation that 3.8 million people in the Netherlands suffer from some form of brain disorder. That's in line with these figures, by the way. So it's basically nothing new, but it is really remarkable. And the main recommendation in the executive summary of this study was also to invest much more in brain research. So that is also uh, what brings me to my current topic. And that's diffusion-weighted magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, this is an expensive hobby, and we don't have these things anymore in Eindhoven. Uh, but uh, yeah, as I mentioned, I'm looking at a more theoretical point of view, so that's not really an, an obstacle. And we're collaborating with partners uh, worldwide on this. Uh, so let me explain a little bit about diffusion. I will not go into the details because I have only 15 minutes. Um, but the idea is that with an MRI scanner, you can obtain uh, signals for every point in the brain, basically, um, uh, 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 sensitized for diffusion of a mobile hydrogen, say water, uh, in a particular direction. So you can do that for every direction, and there is a control parameter in the scanner for that. It's called known as the Q-space uh, parameter, which is proportional to a gradient uh, uh, magnetic field that is applied in the scanner on top of the, of the uh, static field to, to uh, probe a diffusion of water in a certain direction. And you can measure that. So basically, you get a five-dimensional image, one for uh, three dimensions for position, two dimensions at least for the orientation in which you probe the system, and could be even six-dimensional if you also allow the gradient magnitude to be varied. And you can see the more popular diffusion tensor imaging model, maybe mo most of you have heard of that, as a kind of dimensionality reduction of this thing. Um, it produces, yeah, it brings us back to three dimensions basically, but in return for not a scalar signal but a symmetric positive definite uh, contravariant rank, two tenths of value to image. So that's uh, a rather abstract thing that you cannot hope to understand by visual inspection. But uh, we could try and understand this by visually inspired uh, geometry. So if you understand how the visual system works, in theory, then maybe we can apply that also here. Uh, and so that I followed the Jan Koenring's advice uh, to step away from pixels as the basic elements because they are much too rudimentary. They make some sense for problems like segmenting anatomical images. But in this case of tractography, which is um, the endeavor to, to, to reconstruct the, uh, uh, the axons in the brain, the white matter pathways, say, it makes more sense to uh, look at other primitives. So here, the idea is to uh, exploit this capability of the scanner <laughs> to look at uh, not only points in the brain, but also orientations probed by the scanner. And this brings us to a representation where not uh, pixels, but rather line elements. So-called line elements are the, uh, the basic building blocks. This idea is reminiscent of, um, of Einstein's uh, idea to, um, to find certain curves in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, space uh, corresponding to free fall of, uh, of particles. They are known as geodesics. The idea is that these line elements, they are, say, you can think of them as, as infinitesimal vectors attached to each point. 
furnished with the notion of length. And if you uh, shoot particles in the direction of such a vector uh, and let it undergo free fall, it will follow a certain path, uh, minimizing length. And that is called the geodesic. Uh, and that's actually completely analogous to the way Einstein uh, geometrized the way the uh, gravitational forces that are magically acting at a distance into the local geometry so that they manifest themselves as uh, pseudo forces. So this is basically what we do, and let's see how that works in diffusion tensor imaging. What you basically can reconstruct from a uh, MRI scanner is a diffusion tensor which you can map on this ellipsoidal gauge figure. You, you can think of that gauge figure as a sort of fuzzy confinement region for, the, for mobile uh, water molecules. So here, water molecules are more likely to diffuse in the direction that is aligned with the underlying uh, fibrous tissue. Uh, so that's the hypothesis that this uh, microstructure of the brain imparts non-random barriers to water diffusion. So that's what you will observe in the anisotropy of this LSD. <laughs> and so the, the Einstein trick is to, to view this extrinsic process of diffusion in Euclidean space as an intrinsic pro process uh, by hiding it in the geometry of, uh, of some, some curved space. And here's how that works. So the idea is you interpret that ellipsoidal gauge figure as a unit sphere for measuring uh, uh, length. Well, locally, uh, that's, no, uh, that's easy to do, but if you want to do this globally, you have to deform space. Uh, yes. <clears throat> and that's how you end up with a curved Riemannian space. So we have a curved Riemannian space, and we ca can measure lengths that, uh, in a sense, adapted to the diffusion tensor imaging measurements. Um, so let's see how that can be used for tractography. Um, so we have here the gauge figure. Uh, so you want to be able to measure length of curve. So we start with uh, an uh, infinitesimal vector, uh, and you want to measure its length. Well, you can use the gauge figure for that. So just draw the vector and draw the tangent cone from the tip of the vector touching uh, this ellipsoid. Draw the parallel plane through the tangency points and to the midpoint of this ellipsoid, and you have a st uh, two planes with a certain separation. Now you can progress these planes in the direction of the vector. You get a stack of planes. This stack of planes is a pictorial representation of what is known in geometry as a covector. Covector and vector together determine a number, which is simply the number of times the vector pierces the covector. So that's six in this case. And this number six is, by definition, the squared length of the vector. So here we have a vector of length square root of 6, 2.4. And the idea now is, as you can see by the anisotropy, if I rotate this vector in a Euclidean sense into another direction, then the same vector acquires a different length, namely square root of 9, which is longer. So that means that if we, uh, if we want to follow curves that are aligned with the underlying fibrous tissue in which diffusion is facilitated, we should look for shorter curves. And that's what, uh, so that's basically what we do. And then, of course, the problem is, uh, how do you relate the diffusion tensor to this gauge figure? So the, all this idea was simply to, uh, uh, to identify the inverse of the diffusion tensor with uh, the so-called uh, Riemann metric. That's this, basically this gauge figure. And there are some adaptations, like on the right-hand side, an adaptation by Andrea Fusta, who looked at the axiomat axiomatics of water diffusion on the Riemannian space. You get something proportional to it, but it's, uh, it's, it's slightly different. And it also uh, results in slightly different tractography results. This is from a Mikai challenge, uh, where we see that on the right-hand side, well, results are qualitatively similar. On the right-hand side, though, we, will not, we do not observe any of the paths crossing the ventricles. And we know this would be nonsense, but this happens if, with the naive choice of the metric on the, le the left-hand side. OK, so this is just an illustration. Um, <clears throat> So what I was arguing is that um, uh, we should use rather line elements for, as primitives for tractography. Um, uh, but it's a fact that Riemannian space is geodesically complete, which means that any two points in the brain are connected with a geodesic. So there are geodesics all over the place. So you could say, in some sense, we have 100% false positives if you would interpret geodesics as fibers. Of course, that's not the point. They are primitives, just like pixels are primitives for an image. Yeah? You don't interpret pixels as part of a segment because you still have to do the segmentation problem. Here, we still have to do the pruning and remove those geodesics that do not likely correspond to fibers to end up with uh, the more plausible fibers. 
So this geodesic completeness I consider is actually a, a, a good thing for an a priori representation for tractography. There's also a drawback because you see these, by definition, these gauge figures are ellipsoidal. This, they are determined by six degrees of freedom, the co coefficients of, say, the DTI matrix. Uh, and that means that there is a poor angular resolution in the sense that nowadays we can measure these diffusivity profiles in the scanner locally with many more degrees of freedom to more so angular sophistication. Uh, but we can't match that to the geometry because we only have these six degrees of freedom in our gauge figure. So that's a, a drawback of the method and that also explains uh, uh, that it doesn't work uh, very well in, in the case where we have uh, complicated underlying uh, anatomy such as crossings and things like that. And they happen, happen all over the place in the brain. So this is a drawback. And so that's what I wanted to repair. Um, well, nowadays, I mentioned DTI is, uh, uh, well, in the old, in the old uh, paradigm, DTI could be coupled in a one-to-one -one way to Riemannian geometry because there was this one-to-one -one connection between the gauge figure in Riemannian geometry for measuring lengths and the degrees of freedom of the DTI tensor. Now, DTI, uh, so this is a bit awkward in the sense that DTI, uh, that this model builds upon the limitations of DTI because DTI is now, is, is, is a limited uh, model. Uh, we have more sophisticated models here uh, nowadays, known as high angular resolution diffusion imaging models. Um, and we lose this one-to-one -one connection with the geometry. Unless, of course, we also generalize the geometry. And the most natural generalization of Riemannian geometry, already anticipated by Riemann himself, by the way, is Binsler geometry. And then you can reestablish this one-to-one -one connection again. Uh, to geometrize away your diffusion information into the geometry of your space, which is now then called the, the Finslow manifold. And there's only one thing I would like to um, explain about it because the mathematics is too mind-boggling to, uh, to explain in 15 minutes. And I'm not sure how I am in time now. Uh, I mean, a few minutes, yeah. Um, so I just want to explain the essence. We, we extended space from three-dimensional to five-dimensional because we have this orientation degree of freedom for probing diffusivity. So we have a five-dimensional space as it's known in geometry as a tangent bundle or cotangent bundle. Uh, but in a way, you're interested in curves in real space, in three space. So you, you need some kind of projection principle to, to look for the physical, physical curves of interest. This is dimensionality reduction, we, we heard sparsity. <laughs> so we are extending our space, but we are, want to see the physical processes in three dimensions. Um, and there's this notion of horizontal vertical splitting that does it, and you could illustrate it with this uh, uh, figure skating on the left. Uh, so the vertical type of motion, when you move in this five dimensional space, would correspond to a, a, a spinning motion that is not in sync with your translation. So for instance, spinning on the spot, uh, you change your orientation, but you're not moving. You're not moving around in space. That's a pure vertical motion. In technical terms, it has a, a um, <coughs> uh, it's spanned by basis vectors, which are just given by the orientation uh, 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 basis vectors. And the other type of motion is so-called horizontal motion. And horizontal motion, is a, a, a careful balance between translation and spinning. It's precisely the balance that you have when you walk in a normal fashion. So I, when I translate like this, and then I make a turn, I also change my place accordingly. So that I'm always looking forward. So that's a very particular motion in this five-dimensional space, and that's called the horizontal motion. So that's illustrated by this uh, skater. That's making a smooth curve, but keeping the gaze uh, aligned with her uh, direction of motion. And of course, you can combine the two. Huh? So skaters typically explore the whole uh, tangent bundle. <laughs> they do these uh, spinnings and translations sort of independently. But we are interested in the horizontal type of motions. And there you see that what you need, um, I don't know whether I have a pointer here. The essential thing you need is some kind of coupling between it. This, this represents a translation, and this repre represents a spinning, and this is a coupling between translation and spinning. That's precisely this uh, synchrony between translation, translation and spinning that you need for a horizontal motion. And it's in these coefficients, they are known as the nonlinear connection coefficients, that the geometry uh, really reflects. So that's uh, 
what you need to understand. And this geometry manifests itself uh, in, um, in the uh, equations of motions for a geodesic, and therefore equations of motions um, that give you candidates uh, for your neural fiber bundles. Uh, and they manifest themselves as pseudo forces. So the, the equations look like Newton's law, well, yeah, which says uh, uh, free fall means zero acceleration. But in this case, we have pseudo forces induced by the geometry, and they're exactly those nonlinear con connection coefficients. These pseudo forces, they pull yourself towards the Finslerian manifold. So that makes that your actual curves are not straight lines, but they follow the geometry. And as we know, this geometry is induced by what we measure in the scanner. So as to obtain shortest paths that are most likely, uh, or some of which most likely correspond, hopefully, to neural fibers. So the conjecture is that a neural fiber, or a bundle of fibers at the resolution of measurements, is a member of a geodesic conference, of a family of geodesics. There's some caveats. Huh? I already mentioned that uh, uh, a typical geodesic does not correspond to a neural fiber. This is the 100% false positive case if you uh, play the uh, devil's advocate advocate of the devil, we say one of, geodesic tractography doesn't work because uh, 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 they do not, the geodesics do not correspond to fibers. But so the problem really is to find those geodesics that do correspond. And I don't think this is really a solved problem. We are getting closer, but uh, there's a lot to be done there. But think of it as follows. I'm now uh, collaborating with a neurosurgeon. And if a neurosurgeon says, this, I know for sure this point is connected to this point then I have to give him a connection. Okay. I'm done almost. I have to give him a connection. If you use the old-fashioned streamlined method, odds are that you will not find that connection. So this geodesic completeness is, in fact, a good thing. But we have to search deeper for uh, criteria to decide whether certain geodesics, maybe in a probabilistic sense, correspond to neural fibers. So that's one caveat. Don't confuse geodesics with neural fibers. Um, a neural fiber is not necessarily a mineral geodesic, so it's not necessarily doesn't necessarily give you the shortest uh, pass between two points. Only locally, uh, these paths are shortest paths, but globally there can be uh, shorter paths, which are also geodesic. So you can have multiple geodesics connecting distant points, uh, and that's also often overlooked. Depends on how you implement it. So you can implement it in a way that enforces a single solution, and then you may miss actually the geodesic that you that you want. Um, and so that's the, the, the last point, uh, the ambiguity of uh, uh, connections between distant uh, points. Uh, so this is all reminiscent of, this, of uh, Einstein's uh, way of um, geometrizing um, gravitational forces. The mathematics is quite similar, but it's more general in this Finslerian extension. Um, and so we can get uh, uh, more complicated situations. So I started, so actually here's some books that if you're interested, uh, I would recommend. These are the two books that I consulted. And uh, nowadays uh, there are books uh, uh, being published on an almost weekly basis. Um, so to wrap up, we started thinking the world is flat. Uh, then we saw the need for a Riemannian manifold huh, with the advent of diffusion tensor imaging. And that turned out not to be sufficient, so we had to generalize even further and um, obtain a Finslerian geometry, which you can think of as an infinite family of worlds, one for each uh, orientation. So, Bart, um, this ends up my talk. Um, you still look uh, the same as uh, before. You haven't aged, so that's a good thing. And, uh, <clears throat> well, as Alfred already mentioned, this is not at the end. This is uh, just a continuation. Actually, I think it's an excellent opportunity for you to try and put all the ideas you've gathered over the years uh, into uh, a new book on the visual system uh, that starts with chapter one. But of course, in your new life, it's up to you to fill in the details. Uh, and that completes my talk. Yeah.